Okay, hello everybody and welcome to part two of our Girls and Women X in Climbing webinar series. These webinars were made possible through the Gender Equity Grant from Climbing Escalade Canada, so we owe them a big thank you. Before we get started, I want to remind folks that at the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. If you're unfamiliar with Zoom, please take a look at the bar at the bottom of your screen. On that bar, you should see a chat option and a Q&A option. We've disabled the chat, so if you have a question, please enter it in the Q&A. You can post your questions on the Q&A board anonymously if you'd like by ticking the box in the entry screen. You can also upload a question you like or comment on an existing question to add a follow-up. The only thing we ask is that you do not use the Q&A board to message with your friends. I'd also like to let everyone know that we are recording these webinars, so you can rewatch this one as well as our previous webinar on the menstrual cycle with Dr. Natalie Brown by visiting the Ontario Climbing Federation YouTube page. And now I'd like to introduce Christiane, the Executive Director of the CEC, who would like to say a few words. Awesome, thank you, Liz. Uh, hi, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, my name is Christiane Marceau. I'm the Executive Director of Climbing Escalade Canada. I come to you today from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation in beautiful, snowy Ottawa. Uh, I'm honored to introduce today's webinar, Female Climbing psychology, competition, and rivalry between females and climbing. As was mentioned, this webinar is organized by the OCF and it is funded by the CC Gender Equity Grant. Just want to touch a little bit on what the Gender Equity Grant is. Uh, that was an initiative put together by the CC Diversity and Inclusion Committee. So this committee is um, comprised of volunteers. We're nine, there's nine volunteers on uh, the committee. And these members, just so you know, are 78% identify as non-male and 88% identify as non-Caucasian. So this is really what you want a diversity and inclusion committee to look like. It is extremely diverse and really, really well versed into our community. They have many, many different initiatives and you should look out very soon, I believe next week, we'll be launching a demographic survey national demographic survey to try to understand better who are the climbers in Canada and what do they look like, what motivates them, and what actually are the barriers to participation. From that survey, we aim to create many other initiatives and programs to support additional uh, inclusion and diversity in our sport. Another nice thing to know about our efforts to increase diversity is that the Diversity and Inclusion Committee has been invited to add a representative on our board nomination committee. So the CEC Board of Director is gonna launch very shortly our call for nomination. And we aim at increasing our diversity amongst our own governance and be able to be more representative of our community. So that's all thanks to the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. If you wanna support these initiatives and other initiatives coming up from CEC, please look into the um, supporter membership license on the CEC website and as well as our online store where we have very nice little merch that you can purchase and support CEC. Well, enjoy today's webinar. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, Christiane. And now to our webinar. Joining us today all the way from Austria is Madeline Crane, a climber and sports psychologist with a master's degree from the University of Innsbruck. Madeline competed as a youth and adult representing Austria at climbing competitions all over the world. So she has firsthand experience with the psychology and mental challenges climbing presents. Thank you so much for coming, Madeline. The floor is yours. Oh wow, thank you so much for this lovely introduction, Liz. I'm really happy to be here today and I hope you're having a really lovely morning. I think it's morning or noon, wherever you are right now. It's evening here in Austria. So um, let's just get started. Liz, you've already said this. Um, my name is Madeline and I'm a sports ecologist. And um, I'm going to share like a story with you because before I be, become a sports psychologist and I started specializing in climbing because I founded climbing psychology, I've been competing for a really long time and I have gone through this rivalry 
myself during my youth time when I was competing. And now that I'm like years older, I understand a lot more about it, why there was even this competition there in first place, why this rivalry existed. And then also like, why I just always compared myself to others, because I feel like we should understand that to some extent, these things are normal and we should probably need to learn how to better deal with them. So I want to tell you actually a very personal story. You can see this girl, Steffi. And Steffi is three months younger than me, which means I'm in December, she's in March, which means every second year we were in the same category. And every other year, we were not. And because climbing was not so popular back then, there were firstly not so many gyms. And you can see the gyms in this little map that I drew on these two purple points. So they were the only gyms that were there back then. And also there wasn't really um, a team, like a local team back then because the climate was just so small and so, let's say, unpopular that, um, yeah, it just wasn't there. And then um, when I grew up, Competing in Austria always meant if you were amongst the four best people that were sent to international comms, you were most likely to be or make a podium in international competitions because the intensity or density of the people competing was really high or like their level was really high. And then there is this girl, Steffi, which I want to tell you about, because, because what was really interesting is that every second year when we were together in the same category, we were fierce opponents, we were fierce rivals, and we, I would not say, I wouldn't go as far as I would say that we hated each other, but we did not really like each other, because we were basically like, this girl could take away my spot on the Austrian national team. And it's always easy to say, oh, I was probably her fault and she stopped talking to me, but I do probably have to take some credits there because every second year when we were in the same category, we hardly spoke to each other. And then every next year when we wouldn't be in the same category, we would hang out like this. We would make these stupid photos that were done with the computer camera back then with crazy filters. Um, we would go to events together that we really liked. We watched our first Chris Sharma show in real life together. We were best friends every second year. And then once again, next year happened. We were rivals again. We were in the same category and we wouldn't talk. And right now, like years after this, it sounds ridiculous. And I would probably say like, what the hell did we do back then? But back then we did not know better. We did not actually have someone to talk to about this. And we actually didn't know that to some extent rivalry is actually normal and actually a good thing. And comparing ourselves is a normal human thing that we do. And Knowing this, years later, I feel both of us could have actually learned and so much more from each other and could have pushed each other even more if we had known how to better deal with this rivalry. And it took us actually a really long time and actually to the point, well, that we both made podiums in the International Youth European Cups. So that was probably... Um, one of the nicest experiences, we had like this triple um, Austrian victory with Johanna Ernst, who you possibly remember because she pretty much re uh, like won everything in the adults category in the 2000s. But it took us until then to realize that there would be enough space on the podium for both of us. So the question is, what did we miss? every second year by not training together by not pushing each other by not motivating each other and actually using this rivalry that was there as a positive driver 
and I feel, and I can actually speak for Steffi as well, because we've had a lot of discussions about this. Steffi has missed out on a lot of things like as well. And we could have probably done a lot more and a lot better. So why am I telling you this story? And what are we going to talk about today? Like, now, years later, I've become a sports psychologist. I specialize in climbing and I work a lot with climbers. And um, in my work with climbers and working with a lot of competitive climbers, but also recreational climbers, things like what I've experienced during my youth um, happen again and again and again. And a lot of people don't know how to deal with this. But actually, before we learn how to better deal with this, we should actually probably learn to understand these concepts, the concept of what actually happens in our teenage years when we grow up. Why do we compare ourselves potentially even more during that age? Why is social comparison so normal? And what does this rivalry, particularly amongst women, even mean? So I'm really excited today to be talking about these exact topics and to create like, like, create or hopefully create a better awareness of what all these things mean and I actually said this to Liz already at the very beginning I normally really like to um, know who I'm talking to so we can make it even more interactive or if I'm talking about examples so I know how to formulate my examples um, and based on that we prepared some questions um, and I would just like you to just answer them for you as good as you can there is no right or wrong and so let's just see who is there today you gotta let me know whether this actually works the first one is how long have you been climbing for oh wow Nearly there. Oh, wow. Can you see this? Um, can you see this right now? Can you see the results? I know now you should. That's really interesting. So most of you have been climbing between five and 10 years or even longer. That's a really, really long time. So the next question is, what's your role? Like, and in which role are you here? Are you like a coach, a parent, a root setter, a competitive climber? I love it how it's moving, by the way, with the poles. It's just everything. I don't know whether you can see that already. Okay, I'm going to share this with you again. So most of you are climbers, um, either competitive, professional or recreational climbers. There seem to be several coaches here as well. Hi to all the coaches and hi to all the root setters. That's really exciting. And also parents, welcome here too. I'm really excited for this. So we actually have a huge mix of um, people here. So I was actually originally, oh no, let's do this. I do, since we talk about a dollar sense as well, since I've planned on that, um, I'm really interested in who is there. Oh, 
Oh, that's awesome. That's quite equal, relatively. Um, 20 to 30, 17 people, older than 30, 17, and 20 or 10 to 20 years old. Nice. Oh, you're wonderful. Thank you so much for participating. And now, um, I want to ask you, and I would have actually guessed it's not just me, but I want to ask you, have you actually ever experienced rivalry in climbing? So if you're a coach, for example, and you've experienced rivalry in coaching, you can actually press yes here as well. Or in your job, but it maybe okay. That's pretty clear. I'm really, I'm not surprised but it's still really significant if you look at this, like 82% have experienced rivalry in climbing. So the question now is for you, when you've experienced this rivalry, has this been a rather, like, of course, it's not, not only positive or not only negative, but has this been like a rather positive experience a rather neutral experience or um, a rather negative experience. Still moving the poles. Okay. That's really interesting as well. 18 of you said that it has been a rather neutral experience. 16 have said it has been a rather negative experience. And 10, like 23% have said it has been positive. There is no right or wrong. Oh, wait, actually, wait, I had just realized I haven't actually shown the results to you. Here you go. So what I really like in psychology, there is no right or wrong, but it's our about, a lot of times about our individual experience with, with these things. And it, thank you so much, everyone, for participating in these little polls and in these little questionnaires. It really gives me an idea of who is there and we can probably... Um, form these questions and examples and practical um, cases I'm thinking about based on what you're interested in, based on, based on the role that um, you have. Okay, so let's get started with... So, um, okay, I already see that there is a question. So before I get started, Okay, I'm coming back to this question. I can't see it while I have my screen shared. So please excuse this. I'm gonna answer them um, at the end. I hope it's okay with everyone. Um, let's start with the psychological needs and the developments of climbers. What do climbers need? And since there are a lot of coaches there and a lot of competitive climbers, also several youth climbers, um, I want you to actually, I want to actually start with understanding what are the psychological needs during our development, depending on what role we're in. And um, in general, when we talk about adolescents, but even children, we should actually, um, and even not only children, even if we're competitive climbers and we're older, um, there are several factors that actually have a huge impact on how we develop as a climbers. And that's, first of all, of course, the coaches. 
So I think it's really important that you're here and I'm really happy that you are. So because you have a really important role. Then there are parents and siblings, family, without family, without a family supporting and driving the kids to the climbing gym and to competitions, they would probably be not able to do the sport as they do. So yeah, really happy you're here today as well. And then a role that should never be underestimated is the peer group, the friends. And it doesn't matter on which level they climb. If you talk to pro athletes like um, like, for example, Shona Coxie, she said in the past that she would have never gotten where she is today if it wasn't for having been able to train with her really good friend, Leah Crane. Um, and if you ask these really top climbers, they always have friends or a peer group or maybe even, even if it's just one other person that they're really close to that they train with and they push each other. So normally or a lot of times um this peer group is really essential or these training partners to actually push each other um, to get um, successful in climbing and then of course the materialistic requirements which is of course can you pay for the gym um, for all the material that you need like because there is a lot of um material necessary to do this sport and then there's like can you pay for driving to the comms so that includes um, all the material the financial aspects and all of these aspects are relevant in general to develop um, a climber well and to improve his or her performance why am i saying this like generally for me today i want to go from uh, like more detail uh, or like from but like general info into more detail throughout the evening and I want you to understand of what are these needs in general and then like in more detail like what does this mean then for confidence and rivalry I want to introduce you one of the most popular um, uh, models there are in psychology and you might have seen this one before if you have no stress at all. I always think with this one, you cannot um, see this one often enough. And um, if you look at this, we go through different phases, like from childhood to adolescence to adulthood. And on a psychosocial level, different people are differently important in our lives, depending on how old we are. So while the parents, family and the friends are really important during childhood um when children get into their adolescence it's all of a sudden the friends who are number one most important people and then the number one the first most important adult reference person is not the parents anymore but it becomes the coach so with that said it's incredibly important to understand the the role and impact that you have as a coach if you're coaching youth climbers um, and then when they go into um, a professional level, if they're in their adulthood, it's more their partner, whether that's be like their training partner, their little group, but also, of course, their partner, their life partner and their coach as most important reference people. So let's go into more detail about this. And. I know we're not going to talk about children today, but there were some facts which I found really interesting, which I wanted to highlight when we were talking about social comparisons today. So I'm going to do a little detour to cover that as well before we come to adolescence. As said before, for children, most important people in their lives, or even in climbing as their reference people, is their parents, their siblings, and their friends. So these children, they do the sport, they go climbing because they just want to socially integrate, they just want to actually feel really good. And for them at that age, this team spirit, being in a group, is really, really important firstly from their personal needs, but also from a developmental aspect because they learn um, empathy, recognition, they get feedback, they learn to understand each other and they learn about team cohesion 
at that time. And while they have like rather low concentration, so, you know, if you've actually trained and coached these really like these young kids, like younger than around 10, they probably can't climb for one and a half hours straight, but they probably need like a food break in between, like at some point or just a break where they do nothing. Because they're just not able to concentrate so well yet and to persevere. But what they really love at that age is these little competitions. And you've probably actually realized it's really typical for the age that they, let's say, they want to have these little competitions or these games. But if you don't make sure as a coach that these competitions are completely fair, they're going to point it out. So they have this really high sense for justice. They love these competitions. They love comparing each other, but they are really needy for justice. So you can have probably experienced this um, where they come up, like, let's say they climb in two groups, these two routes against each other. And it's like, I don't know how the call is in English, but they all have to climb it. And once everyone is finished, they can sit down and they have done the job. Um, and what if one group route for the one group is easier than the other one they just gonna point it out they just come and come to you and like that's unfair that we can't that was not a fair competition you got we gotta do it again so they like these competitions and what's really natural for them is they love comparing themselves so comparing themselves and competing is not a bad thing at this age rather that if you do something wrong within this um, competition or if someone actually makes a mistake they're going to point it out they're really honest sometimes really crucially honest that they prefer like oh maybe you should rather not say this but that's just natural from their development and they're just like outgoing and social and the reason why I say this and why I wanted to mention this is because we talk about adolescence later on. And I think it's really interesting how this changes when we become, become older. And what's really interesting is, of course, at this age, what the questions that these kids climbers ask themselves consciously or unconsciously which is do I feel good in my climbing team do I feel happy do I like my coach do I like my peers um do I have fun do my parents and my friends support me doing this do I feel pressure and or do I feel, feel like mentally either overloaded or underloaded so they naturally like competing at this age um, but they might not be way, well able to deal with pressure at this age. And I found this um, um, sign, at, sign, you can read it through. I actually thought it was really funny. Um, and even if this was made probably for soccer or another sport like this, it still is very applicable to climbing, I believe. Um, by the way, on a side note, there was a study made where these kids were asked, why do they believe their parents sent them to do competitions? And I don't know actually whether you can answer this right now in the, on the question box, because you have, can have a thought about this yourself. Why do you think, why do you think, or what do you think that these kids say? Why do parents send their kids to compete from the perspective of like the eight-year-old athlete. It seems like it doesn't get through because the comment box is... The kids thought the only reason why their parents sent them to do competitions was to have fun and we all know that probably this is a lot of times not the case but let's just leave it there let's go to the adolescents because there is a huge shift and I want to point that out because I think it's really interesting when we talk about comparison and 
rivalry also to understand that like maybe to some extent as i've said before it is normal so when we talk about adolescence we talk about this age range and as i've mentioned before who is most important it's the peers so having a climbing team having someone at their at a similar age where they can hang out with where they actually can talk to each other with people who have similar interests having a good team cohesion is genuinely important and having a team that does not only foster the rivalry amongst each other but also just fosters the individual qualities of each athlete and that's where the coach comes into place because the coach in, at that age becomes the first or, or the most important adult reference person for athletes. So coaches all of a sudden become real role models and what they do, what they say actually really matters. And I think it's really important that if you are, if we are coaching athletes, we should be aware that we have an impact. We are role models for them. And parents become, you can really imagine because they're parents here in psychology, you explained like this. So this is probably the relationship um, uh, parent and kid when they're kids and they already get the more autonomy and space they need. They'll come back, but they need this autonomy to develop. Um, so with that said, when the parents are not as important anymore, all of a sudden, as said before, coaches become a really important reference person. But I'll go into more detail into that in a second. What happens at this age? And I think this is really important as well to create a better understanding of what happens in our brains. So when we come in, uh, get into our adolescence, um, our cerebral uh, cortex, which you can see in this image here, um has a second growth spurt which means like thousands of nervous connections that we don't need they die off per second that's huge but then also stronger connections of either some new or old connections of new ways of thinking that we need and new things that we learn stronger connections are made so there is a huge change in our brain and what's particularly developing in this part of um, our lives is that the prefrontal cortex, which is basically, you can imagine it's here, um, develops, which is responsible for us. It's so You can also call it the cool system. So in this part, we develop like strategies to stay cool in competitions, to stay cool under pressure. Um, in this um, part of our brains, we make decisions or strategies plans we set priorities we're wearing up consequences like we're really rational we're making risk assessments and we just also have like this cognitive control over emotions and that's really important to understand this um, is because at this age because there's so much happening in our brains we're probably not as well able to suppress our impulses or when we get really emotional at this point we might have really still troubles to planning in the long term it's really important that we start learning how to plan in the long term but it's still really hard like if you talk um, with athletes um, some of them if you talk about their future vision they might have troubles to actually imagine where they would be in the mid of their 20s um, and what is also like a consequence, they're often not aware of consequences of their behavior. So that's on a biological level. And I feel like we should understand this because there is so much just happening in there. Um, but there is something else happening on a more psychological level is, so you have these changes in our brain, but we also develop our identity, which means, who am I? Who do I want to be? And because we don't know yet who we are, we start naturally comparing ourselves to others, even more than normal. It's like, 
and here's an example you enter a competition venue you like okay i don't know the equivalent for the european youth cups this is just the first thing that comes to mind but let's say talk about the youth worlds you enter the youth worlds for the first time and you just see people from from Austria and from the US and the ones from Germany and all oh, the Japanese, oh, they look so fit. I don't have a chance. And you just start comparing yourself. And while it's like in competitions, we're already comparing ourselves because we might not know who we are yet and we're still trying to form our identity. We com might compare ourselves even more during this age. Um, so what happens? We, on the one hand, depend on the support from grown-ups because we're not grown-ups yet. So we're also looking for role models who can offer this orientation and security. Like we compare ourselves, we see who's a role model, who do we want to actually like be like. That's once again where coaches come into place and play a really important role where um, all the climbers, more professional climbers come into place because they can serve as really good role models potentially. Okay, or to not be judgmental, they can serve as role models, whether they're good or not. That might be another discussion. But at the same time, there is this really big need for being taken seriously and really just wanting to not be connected with anything childish anymore. Yeah, this comes to the question down or broken down it comes to who am I? And to go into more detail, what are these questions that adolescents ask themselves? Who am I as an athlete, as a person? What does climbing even mean to me? Is it actually even worth investing so much time and effort? And this is, to be honest, it's an absolute fair question. And this is a question only every athlete individually can answer for themselves. Is it worth investing so much time and effort? Who am I outside sports? Or when I stop climbing, what if I injure myself? Who am I then? Um, and in which position does it put me? Like, and with climbing now getting more and more popular and just like the status actually probably rising if you're a professional climbers, it might has actually, might be a more or less important answer depending on the athlete because the sport is changing. And once again, we should keep this question in mind because we do ask ourselves these questions whether consciously or unconsciously, but we will at some point probably come across them. And it is normal. But if we are coaching, if we're parenting these um, like adolescents and youth climbers, we should probably know about this, that this is something that can be on their mind and that can be bothering them. So comparisons happen in general they happen naturally and in a really positive way in our childhood they make us feel potentially more insecure in our adolescence because we might not know who we are or where we want to be or who we want to be as we're growing older so they can happen and before we go into specifics of this whether they're good or bad and what this has to do with female climbing I want to show you four pictures to actually get more specifically into climbing. And I don't know whether it works to that you can answer in the chat um, to this question, but I would like you to show this question and see what do all these four pictures have in common, okay? Okay, 
support, there is always at least one other person with the climber. You can't be successful on your own, passion, support. There is co collaboration in each picture, a female climbing. The climber is isolated from others and all support comes from outside the climbing courses. More than one person in shot people supporting, spectated by mostly men. That's coincidence. True though. Support. Did I have it? Although climbing is an individual sport, there are always others around the athletes. I think you got it really well. And I think that's exactly what I was actually trying to, um, um, was I was trying to manifest with these pictures. They are pictures out of different contexts. There were competition pictures. There were just fun climbing pictures. There were outdoor pictures. But all of these had in common there is always at least one other person climbing as well. Climbing is an individual sport and you got it all right, but there would be always at least one other person with you. So what does that mean? And here we come into the climbing specifics. In climbing, we can't pretend. We always have someone else watching us, we which means we have to be comfortable with other people watching us. We are automatically in a situation where we compare ourselves with the other person. So we always find ourselves in some way in a comparison scheme because we never by ourselves. It's not like running where we can go out and we just do the sport by ourselves. So whether we go to the gym, whether we go outdoors, we always have someone being there. And this can have an impact on how we do our social comparisons, but also potentially on our confidence. Um, or our confidence, vice versa, can have an impact on how we feel in this situation when we're being watched. Um, the problem, though, is even though we naturally compare ourselves in the setting of climbing relatively often, if not a lot in a lot of situations, a lot of comparisons are not objective. Because if you go back to this image, if for example in this picture, these two, like it's a couple, they compare each other, they have completely different strength, they have a completely different body size, they are good at different things. So even the same route, and even if they had the same level, a comparison would hardly be objective. So what does this mean? I think before that, we actually have to actually differentiate and clear what this actually even mean to be socially comparing ourselves. We've heard about this a lot earlier before, because I was talking about it, when we go through different psychological developments um, when we grow up. Um, but the social comparison is, we have, like, it's natural. It's just, like, a lot of time unintentional and unavoidable. And we just judge ourselves in comparison to our social surroundings. And to some extent, as I've just said, I'm just repeating myself here, so excuse me for that, it's natural, but to some extent, it's even fostered by our environment, by our current development, or where we are and who we are. And in psychology, we differentiate basically between two different types of um, social comparisons, which is, on the one hand, upward social comparison, which you've might heard of, and downward social comparison. Um, upward social comparison is that we um, compare ourselves with someone who is better than us. And this can be actually really motivating, but it can also be really demoral demoralizing and really have an impact on our self-esteem because it can also mean that, for example, if we compare ourselves to someone that is very similar to us, um, 
and this person just crushes us and we feel like we can't actually um not beat that's the wrong word but we can't keep up with this person and we feel like this person just like is just so much stronger than us it can at the same time be really frustrating there is also downward com social comparison where we compare ourselves to someone who has um, achieved less, who is in a less good condition than us, who probably is less fortunate. But um, research has just recently found out, and that was just a really recent meta-analysis that actually has figured that out, that we predominantly um, tend to compare ourselves upwards. So yes, we can compare ourselves downwards, and this might make us feel better, but normally we tend to rather compare ourselves upwards. So the question is, first of all, what negative effects can social comparisons have? Because I want to mention at this point already that, of course, social comparison can both be beneficial. It can sometimes be really motivating and really pushing, but at the same time, it can also be really demoralizing and making us feel really bad about ourselves let's give you climbing specific examples you're part of a team why am i plateauing the way i do why is everyone stronger than me entering a competition let's say you actually qualified for the youth worlds um and you feel like you're really strong and then you get there and you completely suck at your performance for your standards and you feel really bad yourself and you just did not achieve what you wanted to achieve and you might ask yourself will I ever be as strong as Oriane Perton for example who's currently like I think she's youth a this year for the first year and who is incredibly strong and has won so many different competitions youth worlds to youth European cups Will I ever be this strong? And this goes along then with the question, who am I even as a climber? We're back at the questions we ask ourselves when we're at that age where we compare ourselves a lot when we're on a puberty and we're like, who am I if I'm a climber? Who am I as a person? Will I ever be this strong? Does it even make sense to put so much energy into training? Climbing grades. I just recently started working with um, a recreational climber, and I think some of you are recreational climbers, and these social comparisons can happen there as well. Can I keep up? I just recently had um, an athlete who was worried that if she didn't climb a certain grade, um, that the climbing group she's normally climbing with, who are all this similar grade and who a bit stronger than her that they probably wouldn't like to go climbing with her anymore because what if she doesn't yeah what if she can't keep up what if she's not as strong social comparison with a negative impact on how we feel coach athlete relationship the coach likes athlete a oh gotta be careful with that since athlete a as a film which I can highly recommend, by the way, came out um, on Netflix. Coach likes athlete X more than me because he or she made the national team. He or she has shows real potential and the coach really believes that he or she can make it more than I can do. A comparison where the athletes started comparing themselves to the others and wondered whether how good they were actually had an impact on whether the coaches liked them more or less. And then, of course, we have this tendency, um, I call it so-called cherry picking. I, I would love to climb like Nina Williams. as She thinks she's a badass and she's like super bold when she climbs all these high balls. She has incredible finger strength. I love her style. And cherry picking not knowing her in person or only having talked to her once I wouldn't be qualified to call myself that I would know her so if I was like oh I wish I was why is not my finger strength as good as hers why am I not as good as her maybe I only see this small aspect 
of her life and I don't know the rest and that's what we so call so called cherry picking so if we see someone that is stronger than us we only ever see their strength and what they're good at we don't see what they had to put into to get where they are we never actually look at um what other areas um of their lives um how they have been affected or what they have experienced there like and we all humans we not just can't just be reduced to this one strength we sometimes don't know background information that would put things into context and which gives like also these athletes do not only have strengths they also have their weaknesses they also have to have their troubles to deal with upward comparisons that can make us feel bad about ourselves so being a psychologist what do i do in my work and I think one of the questions I was asked is like also not only to talk about the facts and to understand the situation, but also the question to answer the question, what can we do to better deal with these things? And me being a psychologist, I ask a lot of questions in my world, uh, in my work, because these questions aim to better understand yourself and trying to find solutions that suit you in the best possible way. So. I can only ask you to maybe take a screenshot or write these questions down. So if you, in the next time you notice that you're comparing yourself and you feel like this has having a negative impact on you, ask yourself, why do you climb in the first place? What do you most enjoy about it? Instead of like say like can I keep up with this on on these grades I should climb this grade because otherwise they won't climb with me anymore instead of trying to say I should see what happens if you tell yourself I want to do this I'm excited for this I try my best but we'll actually go into more details about these mantras and self-talk later Another really good example, if we get into social comparison and if we feel really bad about ourselves is to notice this and ask ourselves, what would our best friend say to us? Do we really not make any progress? Are we really as bad as we think we are? Um, is there really like anything to disbelieve in ourselves and to... Um, do not trust ourselves, how would our best friend judge the situation? And then I said this already, do not just um, cherry pick people's um, strengths and their abilities, their, what their achievements, because there's so much behind this, which you might not know. There's never just the athlete that performs well and just like has done exceptionally well and just like hence um, achieved a lot there's always like the person has to be looked at more holistically everyone goes through ups and downs everyone has their bad days everyone has their weaknesses and we have to acknowledge that everyone does that not only us so as I said before, there is no right or wrong and there, these social comparisons aren't basically bad. Um, but I really like to think that um, just keep a healthy balance between these and ask yourself these questions when you get in the situation where you feel better about yourself because you're comparing yourself a lot. Something that goes maybe like is very closely connected to um, comparison and which what I want to talk about next is rivalry rivalry what is rivalry what's rivalry compared to competitions is there a difference so if you remember the story I told you at the very beginning Steffi and I were fierce opponents and we were both, we both had competition going on for real because we did 
both want to really make it into the national team. And, but we were also fierce rivals. So what's the difference? Um, first of all, we need to, no, no, I'll show you that first. Competition is basically, it's a situation where Steffi and I were, what is, what's the word, opponents, we were competitors, we were competing against each other. And when we were competing against each other, there was at the end of the day, a result which showed who was better, Steffi or I, or someone else. So there was an actual competition, which was a situation in which our results were just like measured against each other. So there was an actual outcome. The thing though is that we do not only oppose ourselves in competitions, but a lot of times also in trainings when there is no real competition. So rivalry in contrast is like a relationship basically between, um, like let's say it's this relationship between Steffi and me in which we have like it for us it's really subjectively individually important how an outcome is and this can mean for example how we climb a route in a training session session so there is actually no real competition there but we actually um make it a competitive situation because it's individually for us important and there is um and this outcome this competitive outcome actually shows us who is better so even if we're not in a competition we actually are in a rivalry situation where we climb against each other and Rivalry is often experienced, so just sort of fact, you can read it here, so you, or you've probably read it already, um, between two people who are very similar to each other. So Steph and I were competing in the same category, um, and we are exposed to repeated comparison, yes, because we're competing against each other, and like an evenly matched contest. Yeah, that's competition. So we were compared to each other repeatedly because we knew if she can climb this route, I should be able to climb it as well and vice versa. So there has always been this comparison there. And, um, and additionally, yeah, as I said before, there was a real competition. So the question though is, is the rivalry, like having a relationship where we put this importance on an outcome, is it good or is it bad? And I've probably said already a lot of uh, a lot already about this at the very beginning, telling this story. So in my situation, it has been has had a lot of negative impact. But rivalry can also be really positive because in a situation when you know when you train with people that are of your level that um, are in your own training group, you can really push each other and you can really motivate each other. And I really feel back then, years ago, we never actually took advantage of this positive impact because we didn't know and we never had this possibility to talk about it. But it can also, of course, have really negative impact, which means that in that case, worst case scenario, for us personally, we didn't talk to each other for a year. We couldn't actually take advantage of us being at the same level and just pushing each other but we were actually really jealous of each other and just really envied each other if someone achieved like a podium and the other person didn't. Um, and yeah, it's just like our whole relationship, this every second year just really suffered. And in hindsight, we're both just like clapping a fall and it's like, what the hell did we do back then? Um, and also to achieve it, a certain outcome because it's individually so important to us um, it can also increase our risk-taking behavior for us to do moves that we normally might not feel comfortable in doing or that we make decisions that we go do routes 
or climb routes above our limits that we would normally not feel comfortable with. Or we, yet, as I said, we just increase the risk that we're taking. And just because we take risks doesn't mean that we always make a good decision. Let's go into more detail because I think it's really interesting as well. Like, is there maybe a difference in these female rivalries? Is there a difference between rivalry amongst women? And there are several factors that potentially have an impact. And saying this, by the way, I also got to mention that there is hardly any signs in sports in this. Um, there are some signs on the workplace. Um, there is no signs at all in climbing. So these examples here, there are um, examples from work scenarios that can be applied to some extent to climbing. Um, but please, if you're a researcher right there, you probably need to probably scream out loud right now because there is currently no evidence that supports this specifically in climbing. What plays a role when we talk about female rivalries in particular? Role identity can play a really important role in fields that are male dominated. And why do I talk about male dominated fields? So if we talk about competitions, it seems like really equal. There is as many um, professional climbers in competition sports as there are like women and men and also in youth. There are like as many um, girls like guys. But if you look on the average gym, most climbing gyms, at least here in Europe, I can't say about Canada, they're still rather male dominated. So if you go, I would say like 70%, if you go into a modern bouldering gym, it's still mostly guys. So that's why I'm still re um, relating to climbing as a male, rather male dominated sport. Um, I do think, by the way, there has been a huge shift. So when I grew up, I only had male role models like, I don't know, Chris Sharma and Killian Fishhuber. Um, and there are a lot more female role models compared to back then. But I think that's probably a completely different topic. Truth is that in most situations, there are still rather guys than women in the gym. And so what does this mean? role identity and female rivalry with male in a male dominated field um we have different roles in different social groups and these roles can be like roles that we would like to pursue so for example i always say one classic role would be like the class clown in class or um, like the loving mother is another role or the really ambitious, motivated um, climber in the gym. Or say, so I can probably think of a million roles. Like everyone has a certain role within a team. So if you're a youth climber, you probably have your role within your team. If you're a coach, your role is to coach the athletes. You're a role model. You actually have to fulfill certain expectations and here we are depending on which role we have we have certain expectations in these roles like external expectations that are what is expected of us but also internal expectations of us like for example if I identify myself as I'm the strong girl at the gym because it's a gym that is there were rather recreational climbers like hardly anyone's have um, a competitive background and I have this expectation of myself and other people's expected of me as well. She's the strong girl that can climb these pink boulders. And then it happens that I haven't been climbing for whatever reason, because I was injured or I had a break or a lockdown happened. And all of a sudden I can't climb this pink boulder. And I might not fulfill my own expectations and the other expectations that go align with the role that I normally have and in the role that I see myself normally. If I see myself as the strong girl in the gym and there is another girl 
similar to me coming to this gym and crushing all these boulders that I normally um, have to really project, my identity in this moment might feel threatened, which means I might feel threatened because my expectations might be for, might not be fulfilled and someone else is just better than me. And why does it specifically matter for women? We talk about so-called prescriptive gender stereotypes and women still have these expectations of being really humble and friendly. We're expected to be more emotional, to be more smiley and just like, just be happy all the time. Women are not supposed to talk about their accomplishments and their results. Stereotypically speaking, I do believe there is a huge shift. Also, thanks to social media, I think there is one really positive impact about social media where these experiences are shared and where this discussion about topics like this gets started. But normally, they don't talk about their results. And if they do, they're going to get called arrogant, up themselves, probably even less competent because they're breaking social norms. They're breaking these social prescriptive gender stereotypes. They're not behaving like we believe women should behave. And if someone doesn't behave like we expect someone to behave, let's say like role expectations, and that actually make us in that moment, like increase this rivalry, increase this like, like feeling like this unlikable feeling towards this other person, like, ah, oh, she's not cool, or she's just up herself. And I'm gonna actually, in a second, and raise some questions that we can ask ourselves to become aware of our own gender stereotypes and of our own way of seeing things and what uh, we expect of other people. Female rivalries, why might they be different in rather male-dominated fields? This is a study from um, workplaces where I have, to be honest, no idea what it is in that, to that extent can be applicable onto climbing, but I do want to mention it so you know about it and you have heard about it and you can, and maybe let's see, maybe there is going to be a study about this at one point. So at workplaces, particularly in male-dominated fields, the rivalry among women is even bigger because there is only this, let's say, this one seat at the table for a woman. There's only space for one woman at the top. And this, again, increases the rivalry also amongst women because they have to fight each against each other to actually achieve this really scarce outcome, this really desired scarce place, like this seat at the table. So, and here we are again, there can be a parallel drawn between like climbing, if it is still rather male dominated. And if you are the strongest female climber at your gym, in your team, having this title is really scarce and therefore increase this rivalry also in climbing. There are these three questions that I think we should all ask ourselves at some point, because I feel like self-reflection is the first step to creating more awareness and to actually changing something. Do you evaluate women differently from men when interacting with them at the climbing gym? There's this word mansplaining. How how strong do you expect them to be? Do you behave differently? Do you expect different things from them compared to men? Without any judgment, just ask yourself these questions. Like, what expectations do you have of female climbers? How should they behave? Should they talk about their achievements or would you think that's rather off? Just as a food for thought, you don't need to answer it right now. So once again, rivalry can both have positive and negative 
impact and it's up to us to make this decision how to deal with this so how can we deal with that and once again becoming aware of it is probably the first step probably the first step for changing anything and then asking ourselves this question what am i competing for what is it that i'm fighting for what am i scared of why is it so important for me um, what I'm competing for? Can there be two of us achieving the same thing? And can we be happy for each other? Example, Stephanie took us ages to realize. Why do I compare myself to this particular climber in a non-competitive situation? in a normal training session, at the gym in our Tuesday evening climbing session. Is this comparison actually helpful? Does it bring me any new information, motivation, and is it actually a fair comparison? And is this resource I'm fighting for really a scarce one? And then last but not least, I think is a question that we should all ask ourselves at some point, like what do I value in other climbers and how does my behavior, my actions, how I behave in the climbing, climbing gym show my values? How do I live my values? What's important to me? What could I potentially miss out on because of my rivalry? And these are not questions that need to be answered today right away within two seconds you don't need to answer them now but I want you to um, think about them so you get an idea of yourself and of your own maybe gender type gender stereotypes of your own expectations and about yourself like how this rivalry affects you because at the end of the day solutions for how we can better deal with these things are up to us and what's best for us and understanding ourselves better so i think it's so fascinating because i think all of these topics they go and they kind of are connected with each other and you can probably see yourself in the one or this other topic in the one topic more in the other one less and all these topics they impact each other and one topic that we haven't actually talked about yet which we should definitely address in that sense is confidence. Because when we feel confidence, we might not feel as threatened by other people if we're in a competitive situation. When we feel confident in ourselves, if we believe in ourselves, we might not actually care about these comparisons or we actually get motivated by them because we believe in ourselves and we know what we're good at. We know what we can expect of ourselves. And hence, we can work on this to actually, even if we upward compare ourselves to realize like, ah, actually, we can achieve this too. Confidence can have such a huge impact. And what I find really interesting as well is what's very typical for climbing. And why is it so important in climbing to be confident? And why does it show when you won't be able to perform if you're not confident? So what's inherent to climbing is that in climbing, doesn't matter whether we're a creational climber, whether we're a competitive climber, whether we're a youth climber, or whether we're a speed climber, or lead climber, or boulderer, we always risk falling. Like, and basically, I think, like, I, I love this quote by him. So I keep quoting him. I have been quoting him quite a bit for this one sentence. But Chris Sharma once said, 99% of the time in climbing, we, I don't know what he said, we fall or we fail, but it was one of the, I think we fall. This means 99% of the time in climbing, we don't actually succeed in a way that we actually would like to succeed. And if you look at these, let's talk about competition climbing. If you look at how climbing has changed, the routes are becoming a lot more with open movements, with really risky moves, with jumps, maybe even you have to be really confident. 
to action, you have to be really decisive and really risk taking. And in order to be able to take risk and just to make this decision to just go in and to be really decisive and really focused, you got to be confident in yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, and you're really like hesitating, can I do this move or not? You're faster off the wall than you can probably blink with your eyes. Probably an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. But the same is in bouldering. If you have, if you do these really coordinative moves and you might have to figure out in the first goes to do this move, you might actually fail a lot. In a really technical bowler where it's a lot about body movement and you haven't found it right away, this really how to hold the move, hold how to move your body and finding this micro beta to actually do this, you might actually fall off a lot. And this, once again, you're confronted with so much failing that you have to be so confident in yourself to get yourself up again after each try, after each move, after each round to not actually get frustrated by this failing. What's inherent to climbing is that we need this confidence in order to keep going, to push ourselves further and to not get actually a mental breakdown because we've fallen off so, um, so often. So that was a little detour about this confidence and why I think it's so important in climbing. And then there is actually a fact that women tend to be less confident than men, which is really interesting. And on a side note, and I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but I was recently told by a nutritionist actually that first of all, um, increased t- testosterone levels can increase confidence number one second of all if we're on our period we also tend to be like more afraid more easily afraid and less confident so these hormones do have a huge impact but i'm not going to talk about these because that's for some other experts to talk about but just on a side note why are there different so generally women tend to to rather focus on what's been going wrong than what's been going right. So they rather um, focus on how often they've fallen off, what hasn't been going well compared to what has actually worked well. What's been really interesting, if you talk, for example, to male athletes, when you ask them about why did they get so successful what did they do they would tell you very precisely what they did good and they know very exactly what they can expect of themselves what even what podium they would actually get and if something doesn't go well it's not their failure but they're analyzing in a way it's like oh okay this 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 can be improved but this was also really well generalized men tend to focus more on their impact on what they did to succeed whereas women tend to rather externalize success like I guess I had a lucky day I think the other person just had a bad day I think it was just my style for root setting and once I've I've said this already before when talking about female rivalry it's not expected of women to talk about their strength and what they're good at Women are rather perceived uh, more likable if they are humble, if they don't talk about their success. Um, So this also is for sure has a social impact there. Another thing which is really interesting, how are girls already expected to be? Well behaved in school, do their homework, sit there neatly, be wise, don't fight, be princess in the best possible reinforced through all the disney films whereas boys are reinforced from a very young age onwards to be to take risks to be bold to fight for it to be a warrior to like if they fall down get up again and this actually manifests later on like in competition climbing you need to be risk-taking. You need to be confident in yourself. You need to know that you can stand up again. If you go climbing and 
climbing, as I said before, is inherently connected to falling. And the fear of falling is another aspect that is really natural. And still, I feel more girls actually suffer later on for a fear of falling because they have never learned to deal with this risk taking. They were told to behave, to be good in school. They might be taught to be a little perfectionist. And then they, can't, they start climbing and in climbing, you might fall. You lose control, which can trigger this fear. So this is another example where our social norms can have an impact on how we behave later. And um, what is really important is that we become aware of these stereotypes, stereotypes that we have, our inner belief systems, what are these inner belief systems? And when we realize them, when we notice them, work on them, because inner belief systems are, by the way, often passed on from coaches to athletes, from parents to athletes. It's something that we do not only develop by ourselves, but also a lot of times through the influence of the people around us. So it's really important to become aware of them, become aware of these social norms, expectations, belief systems that we have internalized because of this, because they will impact our confidence, how we behave, how we feel on the wall, but also in our everyday lives. There is, of course, the question, like, what now if women were more confident? And um, what if they actually stood up for themselves, if they showed these really typical masculine traits? Again, um, an example that was made in the office room, there were when women appear really um, professional, com uh, confident and competent. There, the downside is, and that's once again, you can work a lot on the confidence on an individual level, but to some extent, this is a, for sure as well a systematic problem because women are perceived to be less likable once again because of these gender stereotypes that we have for how women should be like would we rather be like i just said name it here would we rather be respected or liked like who do we want to be what are our values and then just form our behavioral decisions our how we act how we perceive based on these values work on these inner belief systems so we break these um, lack of confidence belief systems apart and we can actually change them for the better but as you see it's a really tricky subject because to some extent it is systematic it has to a lot to do with our social impact but of course we can work on it individually so the question is once again what what do we do with this information how can we work on this confidence gap and I said this already before, because in psychology, this is in general, the most important step in order to change something, we need to create awareness, we need to notice this problem for ourselves, whether that's for comparing ourselves, and this has a negative impact, whether that's for rivalry, and this has a negative impact, or when we feel we lack this confidence, we need to become aware of it and find out what are the sources of why we lack this confidence. Why do we experience this rivalry, this negative, and use these other self-reflective questions that I've been talking about before? If it's like social norms and systematic problems, stand up for your beliefs, stand up for your values, and talk with people about it if they think otherwise, if they put people in a box into stereotypes. And then as well, once again, on a personal level, be proud of your strength and yeah, don't be afraid to stand up for yourself. I prepared an exercise for you, which can help. I like it's a mindfulness exercise that can help to remind yourselves of your own strengths. And if you're keen, if you're in, I would suggest we just try this out right now. So for the next exercise, just relax and Allow your body and mind to unwind. Close your eyes.
and make sure you're in a comfortable position in which you can sit or lie for the next few minutes. Then feel how your body touches the chair or the bed or the floor or wherever you're currently sitting. Focus on your breathing. Let it flow calmly without influencing anything. Breathe in through your nose. And out through your mouth. Feel how your lungs fill with air and expand as you breathe in. And how your muscles soften as you breathe out. Pay attention to your stomach when breathing in and out and feel how it is lifting and lowering. You can also put your hands onto your stomach to actively feel the lifting and the lowering. Now go back in your thoughts to different situations in climbing, or when you're not a climber, outside climbing. When you felt strong, self-confident, competent, decisive, and happy. Think of a training, a competition, or an outdoor trip. Give yourself time thinking of different situations and try to vividly experience them in your imagination. Now, choose one situation where you felt particularly strong, particularly self-confident, decisive, and powerful. This should be a situation where you can 
where you were really satisfied with your performance. And you so pass yourself. Once you found such a situation, take your time to imagine this situation as vividly as possible. Try to really feel your personal strength right now. How do you feel right now? Try to watch yourself climbing and visualize how it is when you feel this good. How does your posture look like from the outside? How does your facial expression look like? Do you possibly have a smile on your lips? Which other impressions do you associate with this situation? And last but not least, what did you contribute to be feeling this strong and powerful in this situation? Once you've visualized the situation really well, try to find a word, an image, or a song which subsidiary stands for your strength. You should internalize this word, this image, or this song, so you can concentrate on it when you're nervous, when you're insecure, or when you doubt yourself. This image, word, or a song helps you to remember your personal strength in situations when you need it. Then slowly bring the attention back to your body. Come back with your thoughts into this room. Feel your weight pressing down on the chair. And listen to sounds around you.
pay attention to your breathing. Has it possibly changed during this exercise? How does your body feel now? How does your mind feel now? And then stretch yourself just like after a short nap and slowly open your eyes again. Wonderful. Thank you so much right now for joining me for this little excursion, for this little meditation. I hope it helped you to switch off and I hope you liked it. Um, this is an exercise. I can invite you all as a coaches to regularly do it um, in your teams at the end, for example, of a session. Um, or also to the athletes to do them, to visualize this image, to remind themselves of their strength of your, or of your strength when you need it. This is one thing when, when talking about confidence gap and when talking about rivalry and not feeling good with ourselves, this can be an exercise that can help. And with saying this, I was asked this question, whether I have any strategies for coaches who have a rivalry within the team where one athlete in their rivalry seems to gain motivation from it and the other seems to be demoralized by it. And I think this is a great question. I would love to answer it with, when talking about even more specifically about mental training strategies and what we can do as coaches, parents, but also what you can do if you're an athlete to better deal with these things. So what coaches should be aware of that there are that they are um, responsible for creating training climates. And we basically differentiate between two different types of training climates, which is task oriented mastery based climate versus the competition or ego oriented climate in the task oriented climate means like the focus is put on the improvement on the individual abilities of the athletes it's an intra individual comparison and effort gets valued so for example if an athlete has been really bad at finger strength and couldn't really hang on the 10 crimp on the hangboard and then after half a year of training it they're really good at this that's an intra-individual comparison. They have individually improved. On the other hand, there is the competition ego-orientated climate, which puts the focus on winning, on mutual surpassing, and the encouragement, the support is only put onto the best athletes. And they're always put into comparison with each other. So it's not an intra-individual comparison, but like an inter-individual comparison where it's like, you did this better than this. And of course, the question now is, if you're responsible for creating this training climate, what's better? And I can tell you right away, I'll give you this classical psychological answer. There is no right or wrong. There is no real thing as this is better than that, but it really depends on the situation. But there are some things that you should probably uh, keep in mind. If you're working with highly skilled young athletes, the learning effect is pretty much similar with both approaches. If you have lower skilled athletes, they might be profiting more from the mastery based approach because the other one actually threats their ego and it might lead to better learning strategies. And as I've said, it's your job as a coach to create this climate. But what you should keep in mind is that if you create a mastery-based climate, there are significant positive effects. Like, um, for example, 
and increase of intrinsic motivation, enjoyment of the activity, like having more fun doing whatever, there is actually a decreased dropout rate and there is not such a high fear of failure because if I constantly know I've got to be better than the other person because otherwise I don't get the support, I don't get the encouragement, I'm like might not be that interesting. There is a fear of failure can be associated with this. And these athletes also learn that their effort matters their persistence their improvement their hard work to put into this because at the end of the day if they give their best in every training session if they really want it they will see their success and they will see their own improvements and so they learn that effort is the key to success which in turn increases their self-esteem because they learn what to expect of themselves they learn what they need to do to get to a certain outcome so it actually also increases the skill development the question that has been asked before what can athlete what can coaches do if there is like an athlete there that really struggles with rivalry maybe this could be a solution where you try to really focus on this mastery-based training climate in fact there is science that for girls it's more beneficial to actually create such a mastery based training climate compared to an ego based training climate which for boys it just can also be okay but for girls there's explicitly um, research results that say that this is more beneficial if you work on this task involvement on this mastery based training climate this can also have a as said, self-awareness, but also an increased resistance. So if they actually experience failure in a competition, if they don't do as well as they would have liked, they might be more resistant. And the same goes back to mastery-based feedback. If it's like an intra-individual feedback compared to themselves, what they have improved, where they can still work on, that can as well be really really helpful and has really positive effects another thing and this is an exercise for coaches i love this for athletes i love this exercise for parents this exercise is wonderful for recreational climbers is if you do this exercise draw these circles and then ask yourself like in whatever situation you're in let's talk about competitions or for example you're in a situation where in within the training you're constantly comparing yourself and you're seeing this rivalry as a really negative threat ask yourself what's in your control control means 100 percent influence and then ask yourself what can you influence and then in the outer circle write down everything that is out of your control for parents that might be watching their kids climb and whether they send their the boulder or not completely out of their control for coaches it's the exact same they're watching the competitions and the athletes in that moment they have to perform they have to climb and send this route they have to do the speed run and whether they do it or not or whether the time is good or not is completely out of the control of the coach but what is in control of the athlete is their preparation and what they do. And if we focus on something that we cannot control, like, for example, how others do, how my opponents actually perform in this competition or in this training session, it actually can increase a lot of stress and make us feel really bad about ourselves. So instead, also think about all the things that you can control and can influence and then ask yourself what would change if you put your energy onto these two inner circles and just see what happens and maybe in your next training sessions try to specifically focus on these two inner circles another thing is self-talk positive mantras and this is once again an exercise the coach had asked before that what can you do as a coach 
generally this positive mantras, this self-talk can be there to reassure ourselves that we're good enough, even if someone is better, that we're trying our best and we can only try our best and give everything instead of like feeling like we must achieve something, which can increase once again, huge stress. Working on self-talk actually is really, it's really interesting. And you can actually try this. I give you like as a food for thought, an exercise, you can just take a sheet of paper, draw a line within the middle and just collect all these negative thoughts. What if I'm weaker? What if I don't send this boulder? What if I'm kicked out of the team? What if I, no one likes me climbing with me because I'm so weak? Whatever these negative thoughts are, and you just write them all down, you externalize them. And then in the second paragraph on this side, you try to find a solution for each of these negative thoughts, or let's say a positive thought and positive alternative thought. I don't mean that you just go out and just everything is wonderful and glitter and positive and uh, magic and whatever, you know what I mean? Like this exaggerated positivity, that's in fact toxic. I would rather recommend is like, try to reformulate into something positive, realistic, active. And with active, I mean, no negations in there because negations only mean like, I, I'm not going to fall. I only, I only know in that case what I shouldn't do, which is really passive. Try to formulate it into something active. So once again, an exercise that you can do with your athletes, that you can do with your kids. If you're an athlete, you can try this at home. But I also believe that coaches and parents should do this exercise for their belief systems, for their thoughts, for their worries, and also for their language. Because be aware that our language, our thoughts forms our language, which forms or impacts our actions. Our language matters. Here are some examples. Another woman sending my project doesn't mean I'm weak. I don't need to be the strongest in order to enjoy my climbing. There's enough space for both of us climbing. Try to formulate it for yourself, these positive mantras. I've already done this to make also a little bit of a break in between to not just make it a long monologue for me. We just did the journey to your strength before. The progressive muscle relaxation, the problem box are just different ones. I don't know if it's of any interest to you, but I'm currently writing all down all these exercises into a little mental training book for coaches so if you're interested in anything like that a book full of exercises that you can do with your athletes in your training sessions just contact me or stay tuned on climbing psychology i don't know exactly when it's gonna be out but it's pretty far so far so if i may say this i thought this might be of interest to some of you and then, of course, there's always the question, in which environment are you? Do you feel happy in there? Because our, our environment does have a huge impact on us. And there is always the question, even the question was there before as well, if I have any tips for if coaches are parents and also for the strategy, uh, for the question for strategies for this rivalry among this athlete that has actually experiences this really negatively. Is there someone you can talk about this? Can you talk with your coach about this? Do you have, can you talk with a team member about this? Do you have a sports psychologist you can talk to to just bring this topic up where you can just unburden yourself and just like, leave all your I always go like leave all your garbage at everything that is bothering you because having an external person that has an objective external view onto these things to not be like for example if a coach is a parent these are like two roles two different roles and there is no differentiation this can be straining so having sometimes some uh, someone to talk to you about for things that might actually create friction can be really helpful. And particularly also if you don't feel comfortable in an environment. Another thing that you can do as a coach, tell this athlete to talk with someone about this. May that be the parent, may that be 
you or made it be a sports psychologist, whoever they trust and who want, they want to talk to. And worst case, if you don't feel good in an environment and you can't actually change anything and nothing actually works on the better, the question is, worst case, you might still be able to change teams. I think we've said all of these things before, so I do not want to repeat myself. So maybe one thing that I want to point out for women and female climbers, for female athletes in general, the emotional component of coaching is more important, particularly female climbers in their adolescence. Having someone that they can emotionally connect with is really important. And women also care more about the communal aspects of a sport. So also keep this in mind. Yeah, we've talked a lot about our psychological needs, what we can do to support our athletes as a coach, as a parent, what we can do as an athlete to better deal with these challenges that we're facing as female climbers, as climbers, as youth climbers. There was a lot of information. I really hope you learned a lot. And if you have any questions right now, please ask them. I do think we have enough time for you to answer them. Otherwise, I can only give you the invitation that if you have any questions that have been unanswered that you do not want to ask right now, just feel free to contact me via email or via any of the social media channels, wherever you prefer contact me. I don't think this is a topic that where the discussion is finished today. And I hope that with this presentation, you might have actually had some food for thought, some things to think about, some new things that you learned. Yeah. And with that said, um, from my side on this point, thank you very much so far. Take a screenshot again if you want to have these details. Thank you so much, Madeline. I just think it's really important to be aware of the double role that someone has and to have a really good communication, work on this, having someone to talk to about that is not necessary in this construct. So if like in every collaboration with anyone, if we work close together, there will be friction at some point. And the question is, how do we deal with this friction? Do we have somewhere to go? Do we have the capacity, this relationship, to talk about this within this relationship? Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much, Madeline, for joining us today. Um, that was amazing. And I hope uh, everybody was enlightened a little bit by that. Um, I'm sure I, I definitely was. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was great. Thank you so much. I hope, yeah, I said, I hope you, everyone just learned something new and just enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm sure um, I'll definitely be taking a lot of those exercises away. Those are great. Let me know how that goes. <laughs> I will. <laughs> oh, that's exciting. Oh, wonderful. So I guess to everyone, have a wonderful day. For us, it's good night right now, nearly. <laughs> yes, well, good night then. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone.